Hello everyone. In today's video, I am going to be ranking the rest of the champions I didn't rank in my previous part to this video. Another thing is, I've decided to ditch the numbers and statistics-based criteria for these rankings, as with this previous system, newer champions are obviously favoured. With one such example being that Jensen Button was ranked higher than both Jackie Stewart and Jack Brabham. As I'm not willing to side with those opinions, I'm going to instead rank the following champions based only on opinion of how their peak performance and longevity combine in a complete package. Furthermore, I will be basing the majority of this ranking not on the driver's whole careers, just like the previous video, however different to last time, I'm going to base the majority of my ranking off of their performance as champions, not performances overall as drivers. So basically, a driver who consistently won titles in every championship potential car he had is going to be higher on the list than someone with a higher peak, but who bottled some campaigns. And with that, let's get into the video. Jensen Button is by no means a bad driver, but he's definitely the worst in the top 16 of this list, and admittedly, he is worse than some people in part one. He only really had three seasons in the championship potential car, winning one of them. After a debut 2000 season, which saw him become the youngest point-scoring driver in F1 history in Brazil at the Interlagos circuit, he moved to Benetton for 2001, in the last year before the team became Renault. He only scored two points from a fifth place in the last race held in the Forest layout of Hockenheim, compared with his teammate Giancarlo Fisichella's eight-point tally across the season. As the team became Renault for 2002, both the team and Jensen's results picked up. He scored points on seven occasions, picking up two fourth places in consecutive races in Sepang and in Interlagos as his best results, scoring 14 points and getting seventh in the driver's standings. He outscored new teammate Jarno Trudeau by five points. Then for 2003, Jensen moved to BAR to partner with 1997 world champion Jacques Villeneuve. Button got a season best result of two fourth places at the last race at the A1 ring until 2014 and at the final race in Suzuka, garnering 17 points compared to Jacques' six points. He would get his fifth different full-time teammate in as many years as Takuma Sato partnered Jensen for 2004. Jensen had the second quickest car that year, and he took his first career podium in Sepang, took his first second place in Imola, along with his first pole position, and then took 10 podiums in total in the 18-race season, finishing third in the driver's standings, only behind the dominant Ferraris of Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello. He outscored teammate Sato 83-34 and stayed with the team for 2005, although the car performance was nowhere near the level of a year prior. His first podium and points came in Imola, except they didn't as Jensen was disqualified from a third place finish as his car was underweight and BAR were subsequently banned from the next two races. He took pole in Montreal but retired due to an accident and then after failing to score in the first nine races of the season, he scored points in every single one of the remaining races. Two third places in Hockenheim and Spa were the high points and he outscored Sato again, this time 30 to 1. 2006 saw ex-Ferrari punching bag Rubens Barrichello sit alongside Jensen in the team that was now a Honda factory team. He had sporadic points finishes in the opening half of the season, scoring third in Malaysia and getting pole in Melbourne as the early season highlights. Then after fourth in Hockenheim, he won in Hungary after 113 race starts, which at the time meant that he had the third longest wait for a win in F1 history. Then he scored points in all the remaining races in the season, rounding off the season with third place in Brazil, meaning he finished sixth from the driver's standings on 56 points, although the two drivers were separated by 26 points. 2007 saw Honda fall off a cliff in performance, as Jensen scored points only three times, with the best result of fifth in China, scoring six points in total, whereas teammate Barrichello couldn't score any. 2008 was a similar story, and Rubens outscored Jensen, thanks to a third place in a rainy Silverstone race, but overall it was still an uncompetitive year for Honda. 2009 was Jensen's title winning year, and in the first half of the season, he was practically flawless. The second half of the season was obviously less successful, as his car went from being utterly dominant to utterly midfield, but he still picked up points here and there to consolidate his championship crown. Although Rubens was better in that second half of the season, Jensen was ruthlessly consistent before the car fell off in performance, and that's just how good he was that year. His McLaren stint with Lewis Hamilton, in my opinion, was underrated too. In 2010, he had a few faults which were not his own, such as his crew leaving an entire radiator bung in his side pod at Monaco, and with better luck, he could have been in a title fight. 2011 was a scruffy season for Lewis, and Jensen capitalised on Lewis's downturn by finishing second in points behind a runaway Sebastian Vettel. 
Jensen had his rough moments, for example in Canada, on his way to winning. He collided with Lewis and torpedoed into the side of Fernando Alonso. But I suppose that that race is such a can of worms that if you opened it, you'd have enough Bush Tucker trials for the next 2,000 years. To be honest, Lewis stepped it up for 2012, and it was almost as if his and Jensen's situations were reversed from a year prior. While Lewis consistently performed well, even if he lost upwards of 50 points or so due to reliability issues, Jensen could win the first and last race of the season comfortably. But then in Canada, where he won the year prior, who was completely anonymous and finished 16th. During their time as teammates, Lewis was quicker, but Jensen was more consistent and got involved in less incidents and had less mechanical failures. Moving into 2013, it was clear McLaren were heading downhill as they had the genius idea to scrap the car platform from the previous year, despite the car being fastest in one lap pace. Jensen and new teammate Sergio Perez struggled in the midfield and tempers flared throughout the season as they had comings together on track numerous times. The new engine regulations benefited all Mercedes power teams, including McLaren, and a double podium in Melbourne alongside teammate Kevin Magnussen showed promise, but again, the team stagnated as the season progressed. Jensen's performance as an average machinery never faltered, but his patience will be tested in the final two years of his full-time career. His performances in 2015 and 2016 were overshadowed by a car with a terrible power unit, although the veteran Brit showed glimpses of brilliance, such as in Koto in 2016, he gained many places on the opening lap of the race, which showed he still had it. His retirement at the end of 2016, age 36, came as no surprise. However, his one-off return at the Monaco Grand Prix less than a year later also wasn't a surprise. He was on the pace of regular driver Stoffel van Dorn in qualifying, but grid penalties mired him at the back until he clumsily collided with Pascal Verlein at Portier, which ruined both drivers' races. Jensen was a very talented driver who was often overshadowed by other similarly talented drivers in better machinery, and he's also the only driver who beat both Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso as their teammate, both of whom were generational talents in their own right. Nigel Mantle is a cult hero in the UK because of his daring and committed driving style and friendly personality. He was able to fight for adversity in ways most drivers wouldn't even dare to, and on his day he could hang with the best of his era, and beat them convincingly. However, the reason he's so low in this ranking is because firstly, he only has one championship, and secondly, he did have five championship winning cars only to get one title. Admittedly, not all of his failures were his fault. For example, one of his five championship potential cars was a 1994 Williams, which he didn't even do a full season in, but I know some anorak would point it out if I didn't clarify. His early years at Lotus were a precursor to his success at Williams. He joined a fledgling team in 1980, but despite having won the Drivers and Constructors Championship merely two years prior, hadn't won a race since. Colin Chapman was doing some dodgy dealings with the makers of DeLorean cars, the same DeLorean as those in the Back to the Future films, and thus his F1 team was suffering. During Nigel's first season, during the race in Long Beach, his car developed an issue and fuel began leaking into the cockpit as Mantle kept on driving. He would later be diagnosed with having third degree burns as he had continued driving despite his predicament. After a fairly anonymous first part of his career, 1984 saw Nigel show his potential as he was leading in Monaco before crashing out at Massenet. Then for 1985, he moved to Williams. He got his first career win in Brands Hatch that year, and then in 1986, he fought for the title with both his teammate Nelson Piquet and Frenchman Alain Prost. He was in a winning position at the last race in Adelaide until his tyre blew out colossally, and he was out of the running thereafter. 1987 saw his PK win thanks in part to Nigel sustaining a season-ending injury in a practice accident in the second-to-last race at Suzuka. After a dull 1988, Nigel moved to Ferrari, although the only year that team fought for the title while Nigel was there was in 1990, and it was Prost, not him, who took Senna to the final race in Suzuka. I suppose his one crumb of comfort was that he was the last driver to be handpicked by Enzo Ferrari to drive for the Scuderia before he died. His return to Williams for 1991 coincided with a late-season title charge, although the true potential of the Williams team would be realised in 1992. He absolutely dominated in the best car with a subservient or otherwise not up-to-scratch teammate. His qualifying margin to a second-place Ricardo Patrese of 1.9 seconds in Silverstone was pure stardust and is the biggest qualifying gap between first and second in F1 history in terms of percentages. At the end of the season, it was definitely at least a bit ironic that after 12 seasons of grit and determination, almost winning but never getting close, enough, the one time he does win, he's won at a canter in dominant fashion. The fact that he was then unceremoniously booted out of Williams for 1993 in favour of three-time champion and F1 politics wizard Alain Prost is even more ironic. Williams in this era tended to have a knack for getting rid of their world champions, whether it be Nigel or Damon Hill, and maybe this is why their competitiveness in F1 shone bright then faded out, never to return in the same way. Nigel's F1 career wasn't over,
over despite having moved over to Cart to win that championship across the pond. And after Ayrton Senna's death in Imola in 1994, Williams wanted an experienced driver to replace him, and Bernie Eccleston wanted at least one world champion on the F1 grid. So Nigel came back and was instantly competitive. I think that if it was Nigel who started the season instead of Damon Hill, then Nigel would have won the title in what was a much superior car to Michael Schumacher's Benetton. After Williams again dumped Nigel for David Coulthard, he went off to McLaren for 1995. But after the car that the team built for him was too small, and once they built a car that could fit him, he then retired from F1, probably partially because the team wasn't competitive, and partly because he himself wasn't competitive. It's funny then that the driver market came full circle, and after Nigel's early season retirement in 95, it was his Williams replacement, David Coulthard, who took the McLaren seat alongside Mick and Hakkinen that Nigel was supposed to occupy. Nigel is well received amongst the press and the fan bases of Formula 1, especially in the UK. Although one thing I will say is that on Tom Clarkson's Beyond the Grid podcast, he sounded like he was bigging himself up way too much and sounded like a self-obsessed twat. Although, to be fair, that does happen with a lot of drivers that go on that, on that show, like Jackie X. As I don't know him personally, I'm not going to act like this is proof he's a cunt, especially since every other source says he's actually not. I really am a cynical bastard, aren't I? Kimi is the first driver in this part two of the list whom it genuinely feels wrong to put this low. Saying that, seeing who's above him is definitely in good company. He only won one championship despite driving at least four title winning cars, but unlike Nigel or Jensen before him here, all of his losses were due to factors almost always outside of the Finns' control. After a stellar debut campaign in 2001, which saw him stun everyone, he claimed his first points finish in his first race at Melbourne despite only having competed in 21 official car races beforehand. He was offered drives from both McLaren and Ferrari in 2002, but presumably didn't fancy being a cook as much as Rubens Barrichello did. So he chose McLaren, replacing fellow Finn Mika Hakkinen, who had retired. Sorry, I mean, gone on a sabbatical. His first season in the top team coincided with one of the most dominant seasons in F1 history for Ferrari. So there wouldn't be many, if any, wins on the table for Kimi. His teammate David Coulthard, or anyone else whose name wasn't Michael Schumacher or Rubens Barrichello that year. 2003, however, was a different story, as McLaren and Williams both had cars that could challenge for wins and the title. Kimi grabbed this opportunity with both hands, and despite winning only the one race in Sepang, he was ruthlessly consistent. Then after Ferrari pushed the FIA to clarify the rules on tyre pressures to give their rivals a handicap, Schumacher pulled in front and won the title by two points. 2004 saw another dominant year for Ferrari, but Kimi took a surprise win in Spa as the McLarens came on strong once Adrian Newey ditched the MP418 concept, which was a basically a death trap. 2005 would see McLaren build even more on 2004's potential, and Kimi was again ruthlessly quick and efficient, but his car and tyres let him down on numerous occasions, such as in Imola and the Nürburgring, both from the lead. He would end up losing that potential title as well, this time to Fernando Alonso, despite some legendary drives in Monaco and in Suzuka, and in 2006, the McLaren would again fall off a cliff in performance, like in 2004, although Kimi still showed promise in races such as Hungary, when he was leading but retired from a crash after getting caught out by back markers. Kimi would move to Ferrari for 2007, replacing the seven-time champion Michael Schumacher, and would win on his Ferrari debut in Melbourne. His typical consistency meant that going into China, he was an outside long shot for the title. He would realistically need to win or come second in both the race in China and Brazil to win the title, which he did. And he needed to hope that his McLaren rivals, Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso, would crumble. Lewis decided to go sandcastle digging in the gravel trap in China, then his gearbox went on walkies in Interlagos. Fernando finished on the podium in China, but struggled in Interlagos, meaning both McLaren boys finished the season equal on 109 points, while Kimi would usurp both at the last minute to take 110 points. Just like Nigel Mansell, he'd won his title in probably his least convincing title run of his career. Then in 2008, Kimi started off well, but around the time of a Canadian race, there were rumours that Fernando Alonso wanted to sign with Ferrari, and with Felipe Massa, Kimi's teammate being Brazilian, the team allegedly wanted to bin off Raikkonen because he wasn't going to be as marketable in Latin America as Massa, where Santander wanted to focus their marketing. Kimi would see out his Ferrari stint and stay competitive even when his 2009 car, the F60, was a shitbox. He still managed to win in Belgium. He took a payoff from Ferrari to sit out the 2010 season, so he indulged in driving both WRC and NASCAR, but the Finn was back for 2012 with Lotus. His two-year stint with the Enso team bore much fruit on track, including two wins and countless podiums, but off-track towards the end of the 2013 season, a ludicrously miscalculated clause by the team in his contract meant that he was owed nearly 20 million euros in bonuses, money that the team didn't have. 
He chose not to chase the money he was owed in order to make sure people's jobs weren't lost, and he was back to Ferrari for 2014. The car was dog shit, but while teammate Alonso stood on the podium on numerous occasions, Kimi only achieved a third of the Spaniards' points. Kimi would get a new teammate in the form of Sebastian Vettel for 2015, and Ferrari was way more competitive. To be honest, Kimi's 2015 and 16 seasons were fairly nondescript, but in 2017 he showed glimpses of brilliance, for example in Monaco, taking pole position, and then in 2018 he would take pole position in Monza in front of a Tafosi, then he won in Cota for the first time in 113 races. Even Kimi knew it had been a while, when he said that that elusive win had come fucking finally. 2019 saw him dropped for Charles Leclerc, and he took the young monogast driver's place at Sauber, which was becoming Alfa Romeo. To be honest, in his three years at Alfa, you could tell he mostly didn't care. He was about even with Antonio Giovinazzi, although he showed off his skills in Portimao in 2020, dancing around everyone like they were amateurs in the greasy conditions. Everyone likes Kimi because he's so relatable, and he doesn't pretend to be something he's not. He just wants to race and didn't care for the PR, nor the media, nor the stuff that wasn't directly linked to the team and his on-track performance. Now he's retired, I think we can all leave him alone, because he knows what he's doing. Let's just hope his son Robin can do well in racing too. Having a no-nonsense F1 champion as his dad should help him go faster. Next on this list is the other flying fin. Mika Hakkinen started his F1 career in 1991 with Lotus, but got his big break with McLaren in 1993 when Michael Andretti left the team mid-season. He outqualified Ayrton Senna in Estoril in their first weekend as teammates. Then when he was questioned about where his pace had come from by the three-time champion, Mika gestured with his hands and said it was the balls that made him faster. This is the same Ayrton Senna who punched Eddie Irvine in the face for unlapping himself only a few races later. Mika definitely impressed and stayed on with McLaren, even as they fell into their mid-90s slump. It got so bad they had Philippe Alio, James Hunt's super best friend, in the car for one race in the 1994 season. Mika would have to wait until the end of the 1997 season to win his first race in Jerez, as Schumacher and Villeneuve's collision put him in the right position. McLaren became the team to beat in 1998, and Mika beat the Michael, fair and square, over the course of the season. He may have had the better car, but he can only play the cards he's dealt as best as he can. 1999 was much scruffier for Mika, however. A very twitchy car led to multiple mistakes being made by Mika throughout the season. He crashed out of the lead in Imola and in Monza, but after Schumacher's leg break, his teammate Eddie Irvine clearly wasn't good enough to assume the reins of the Ferrari stable. 2000 saw another year and another title battle between Schumacher and Hakkinen, but after three years of losing out to his rivals, Michael triumphed. Mika and Michael's rivalry was summed up by Michael's move on the fin in Spa of this 2000 season, seeing the two go either side of Ricardo's onto and fight going into Lake Homme. It summed up both competitors, super ballsy, super close, super entertaining. Mika was the only driver who could compete with Schumacher on a regular basis in the Germans' prime, and his final campaign in 2001 saw him take his last win in Indianapolis, and then he retired, I mean, took his sabbatical, having won two championships and took 20 race wins. He is often overlooked by modern fans who don't know just how good Mika Hakkinen could be on his day. Sebastian Vettel really is a curious case when it comes to F1 rankings. At his best, he was certainly one of the greatest of all time. However, when things didn't go his way, he tended to falter by the wayside. His instant impact getting points on his debut with BMW Sauber in Indianapolis in 2007 proved he had potential, and he showed quiet and reserved promise when he took over from Scott Speed at Toro Rosso later that year. Despite his clumsy incident in a sodden Fuji race that he was penalised for despite it not being his fault, Seb showed great promise as 2008 rolled around. Obviously, his Monza win stands out as his best performance. However, he was competitive elsewhere, including in Brazil, as he nearly denied Lewis Hamilton of his first world title by overtaking him towards the end. His promotion to the main Red Bull team, replacing David Coulthard, wasn't a surprise, and as Red Bull shot up the pack, Vettel grabbed the opportunity to shine with both hands. He won a wet race in China amongst a sea of Braun wins, and came on strong at season's end as Braun faltered. He couldn't win the 2009 title, as Jensen had built an unassailable lead in the beginning of the season, but 2010 was a more consistent year. He had his moments of madness, such as in Turkey, running into the side of teammate Webber, but capitalised on others' mistakes too. He may have been a bit lucky in Abu Dhabi, as bad strategy befell his other title rivals, but that's racing. If people still doubted him after 2010, they would have been done to do so after 2011. 11 wins and total domination. He bottled a win in Canada and retired in Abu Dhabi. However, those are the only blemishes on his record that season. He was parallels above his competitors in 2011, however, came back down to earth in 2012. The Red Bull wasn't the fastest car all season, and although his title rival Fernando Alonso definitely had a worse car, Seb recovered from a shaky start to the season well by having a strong end to the campaign. Fernando deserved the title more, however, Seb still performed good. 
If people thought the wrong man won in 2012, they would not be able to say the same for the following year. By the summer break, Sed had a 38-point gap to second in the championship Kimi Raikkonen. By the end of the season, the gap to second was 155 points as Seb took nine race wins on the bounce in the last nine races of the season. That's a gap larger than six race wins and he was now a four-time world champion. His career after that went downhill, however. 2014 was a low point after five years of success. He struggled to get on the podium regularly while teammate Daniel Ricciardo won three races and beat him in the standings. Disillusioned with the team that gave him his success, Vettel joined Ferrari in 2015 and got his first win on his second outing for the Scarlet team in Sepang. His career was definitely on the upturn, however, as it was clear he'd not just changed as a driver, but he'd now matured as a person. Aside from a few moments of anger in 2016, he was mostly calm and bounced back from a winless 2016 season by fighting Lewis Hamilton for the title the following year. His pace was undeniable, but a late season bad run of form left him taking runners up in the Drivers' Championship. It was a similar story in 2018, as his championship loss came from his own doing. He wouldn't know it at the time, but the arrival of Charles Leclerc into Ferrari would lead to his demise. Unlike Kimi Raikkonen, Charles wasn't willing to be Seb's number two, and after flashpoints in Singapore and in Interlagos, the two clearly had tension building. Covid affected the 2020 season's timeline, and Ferrari bizarrely announced Seb's contract would not be renewed beyond the season ahead. To be honest, the season as a whole was one to forget for the German. One podium while Charles got multiple was proof that Charles was the better driver at that point. Seb would go to Aston Martin for 2021, stirring up drama himself as his signing necessitated the removal of Sergio Perez from a Silverstone-based team. To be frank, his last two years were just eh. He capitalised on a chaotic race in Baku and in Hungary in 2021. However, his lack of interest in the sport was beginning to show. His last race in Abu Dhabi in 2022 saw him go out with one final hurrah and he showed more competitiveness in that one race than he had since his last title fight in 2018. Seb really is a curious case when it comes to rankings. He was so inconsistent and had such an awkward career trajectory for someone who achieved so much. Jack Brabham is often overlooked by many when it comes to his on-track achievements. I think it's partly because he's not in the GOAT debate with the likes of Fangio and Schumacher. However, at the same time, he can't be considered a fluke or a circumstantial champion like Phil or Damon Hill. Jack had a few seasons to start his F1 career, entering a handful of races per year until he was signed to the Cooper Works team in 1958. However, it was a 1959 season where he came of age, winning his first title. 1960 saw the Aussie win five races in a row on his way to his second title. However, he would then become uncompetitive for five seasons or so. His Cooper team fell off in performance. Then he started his own team, which took a while to make his way to the top. 1966 would be his next competitive season. And at the age of 40, he won four races in a row mid-season to win his third world title. After losing out on a fourth title to his teammate Danny Holman in 1967, Jack spent two years in relative uncompetitiveness, but then in 1970, aged 44, he made an early title charge but came in sixth place in the title race after failing to score in any of the last six races. Then he retired from F1. Jack was a legendary pioneer who was competitive into his mid-40s and his name in the sport continued until the early 90s when the Brabham team finally folded. Jack died in 2014 and was the last surviving champion of the 1950s and was one of the greatest of his era even if he wasn't the best. The first driver to break the top 10, Fernando Alonso is one of the most talented drivers of his generation. However, after his double triumph with Renault in 2005 and 2006, his failed title bids in 2007, 2010 and 2012 bring him down this list. He lost the 2007 championship because he was too busy trying to put manners on his rookie teammate Lewis Hamilton early on in the season, as the two took points off each other, allowing Kimi Raikkonen to stay in the hunt and usurp them both right at the end. After two unsuccessful years back at Renault, his move to Ferrari in 2010 coincided with his next title challenge, and he didn't really put a foot wrong until Abu Dhabi when he was in the wrong strategy and lost the title that he was stuck behind Vitaly Petrov. After 2011 saw a downturn in Ferrari's form, 2012 was meant to be a return to the top. The car was only fourth or fifth quickest at best to start the season, but Fernando took it to the championship lead by the summer break. Being blown up by Grosjean in Spa and having his tyre blow up in Suzuka brought Sebastian Vettel way too close for comfort. Then after a good run of form for the German, both Vettel and Alonso went into the final race in Interlagos 13 points apart, with Alonso behind. Vettel recovered from an early spin which put him to the back to finish sixth, while Fernando could only finish second, and it meant that he finished three points behind Seb. Had he been involved in less incidents, he could have won the title, but this would be his last title challenge. He showed decent early season form in 2013, but the car wasn't quick enough throughout the season to mount a title challenge. 2014 was a train wreck, although Fernando nearly tripled his teammate Kimi Raikkonen's points. 2015 joining McLaren Honda was a train wreck. 2016 was a train wreck. 2017 was a train wreck. 2018 started with promise, but overall was a train wreck. 
He then retired for two years while he went off trying to get a triple crown of motorsport. Then on his return in 2021, he performed admirably with highlights like a podium in Qatar. Then in 2022, he had good performances like in Montreal qualifying and was looking to advance in Spa before he tangled with Lewis Hamilton. 2023 so far has seen Nando show a lot of winning potential. However, after his botched strategy in Monaco, which arguably cost him the win, he nor the team has been as competitive since. Fernando, like Jack Brabham, is competitive into his 40s and is proving that experience and class are permanent. He may have bottled some of his title challenges, however, his good performances in between trump the losses. Graham Hill is criminally underrated, in my opinion. He's the only driver who could properly challenge Jim Clark on his day. After four seasons, driving privateer Lotus and for BRM in F1, Graham was thrust into major competition in 1962 for the first time, age 33. He won four races and got two second places on his way to his first title, beating the likes of Jim Clark and Bruce McLaren. He would then be the bridesmaid to Jim Clark's two title wins and the title of John Surtees, although he probably did deserve the 1964 title over Surtees, as it was Surtees' teammate Lorenzo Bandini who conveniently put Graham out of contention in the final race in Mexico after crashing into him. Graham switched to Lotus in 1967, and after the team's loss of Jim Clark at the beginning of the 1968 season, Graham rallied the team around him, and he won three races on his way to his second title. 1969 saw Hill win his fifth Monaco race, a record which would stand until Ayrton Senna came along and won six, but later in the season at Watkins Glen, Graham would spin off on a patch of oil, he then got out and push restarted his car on his own, then he signalled to his team that he was going to come back in next lap to redo his seatbelts. He would not make it around again as he suffered a puncture on the end of the longest straight of the Glen and he was thrown from his crashing Lotus which broke both his legs. He missed the final race of the season in Mexico but was back in the driver's seat for 1970. However, it was clear he wasn't the same driver as before as in the next five years he failed to reach the podium ever again. He retired in 1975 after failing to qualify for the Monaco Grand Prix, the race he'd won five times previously. Until the likes of Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello came along, his records of longevity were mostly unmatched. He had survived driving in F1 for 18 seasons, while no less than 28 drivers died either driving F1 cars or driving in F1 events. You could fill a grid and more with the F1 drivers who were killed in action while Graham was driving in F1. He may have not even been half the driver he was before after he broke his legs. However, in his heyday, he was a multifaceted and a legendary driver who is the only driver to win the Triple Crown of Motorsport. Now, some people might be looking at me like I've just dropped their firstborn off of the balcony in Michael Jackson style by putting Max Verstappen ahead of Graham Hill. But remember, this list is for ranking drivers' abilities to win championships, not their ability in general. Max came into F1 in 2015 and joined Red Bull in 2016, winning on debut with the Milton Keynes outfit. After winning multiple races per season from 2016 to 2020 and showing rapid speed but maybe lacking consistency, his first title-challenging car came in 2021. He took it to Lewis Hamilton instantly, and the only high-profile incident that year that you can realistically say was his fault was Monza. In Silverstone, Lewis went walkies off the apex, and in Jeddah, the FIA didn't communicate well and caused 90% of the confusion in that race. Nothing in Abu Dhabi was his fault. Again, the FIA made the decisions they made that day, but Max wasn't the one on the phone with Michael Mazzi telling him to bring out that safety car. With that, and Max's first title in the bag, he won 2022 at a canter, and it's going to be the same in 2023. Hate him or love him, he's the best driver on the grid right now and he's both ruthlessly consistent and fast. You could start him last in every race and he'd probably still win by 30 seconds. I'm exaggerating at this point, but yeah, Max is ruthless and that's why he's this high on this list. Lewis Hamilton is a tough person to rank here because although he's won seven titles, he also missed out on a few. 2007 saw him nearly win the title in his rookie season. His early season form was incredible, and although he bottled in China, he was already an outstanding talent. 2008 saw him win, even if he was lucky that Glock went slowly. Then the next season where he could title for the challenge was 2014, because in 2010, he was an outsider towards the end of the season, and in 2012, McLaren had a tendency to self-combust while he was leading races. Anyway, in 2014, the dominant Mercedes led him to a second title after being pushed all the way by Nico Rosberg. But in 2015, Lewis had one of his best ever seasons, winning the title at Cota with three or four races left. I'm not exactly sure, I can't remember. But in 2016, it was a different story as Nico Rosberg did everything possible on and off track to win that title. Was Nico lucky that Lewis's engine blew up in Sepang? Yes. Is that just racing sometimes? Yes. After Rosberg's retirement, Lewis held off an early season title challenge from Seb Vettel in 2017 and 18, then cakewalked 19 and 20 to claim his 6th and 7th titles. 
In 2021, he had a good campaign, but made way more mistakes than Max Verstappen did, notably in Imola, in Baku and in Silverstone. Whether you think Monza was either driver's fault or a racing incident is debatable, and the FI fumbling and being generally incompetent in Jeddah and Abu Dhabi isn't Max nor Lewis's fault. He hasn't had a chance to challenge for the title since, but had he had a slightly different course of events, he could be an 8, a 9, or an even a 10-time world champion. The Michael had bundles of raw speed and consistency, but when push came to shove, fighting for a championship, he could be a proper dickhead. His first title challenge came in 1994, after three seasons getting podiums and wins with Benetton. And despite being banned from or disqualified from four races mid-season, he still went into the final race in Adelaide with the title available to him. He took the title in acrimonious circumstances after colliding with Damon Hill. However, he deserved it after being effectively banned for four races for what was, at most, a one race ban worthy offence. 1995 was a cakewalk, but after he moved to Ferrari, his next title challenge was in 1997. The fact he kept up with Jacques Villeneuve despite being in a much worse car either shows just how good Michael was or just how mediocre Villeneuve was. However, despite his great results all season, his actions in Jerez overshadow all of it. While I defended him from a 1994 incident and battle, I won't for this one. It was a blatant act to try and take Villeneuve out and he was rightfully disqualified from a championship. In 1998, Schumacher just got beat by Mika Hakkinen fair and square, both in terms of pace and in terms of consistency. Then in 1999, Schumacher was looking competitive for the title again, but broke his legs in Silverstone after he ploughed into the barrier following a brake failure. Considering his teammate Eddie Irvine only narrowly missed out on the title in his absence, you must assume that Schumacher would have won it. Although maybe Mika wouldn't have crashed as much knowing it was Michael chasing him and not Eddie. 2000 saw his work with Ferrari finally come to fruition as he won the title over Mika having lost it three years in a row. 2001 through 2004 was domination on the surface of it, but there was a title battle in 2003 which most people forget about or didn't know it happened in the first place because they knew our fans. In 2005, Ferrari was shagged by the new tyre regulations and Michael had no challenge of challenging for the title, but a 37-year-old Chewbacca had a resurgent 2006, but again was pipped at the post by a young Fernando Alonso, at which point he retired, allegedly being forced out of a Scuderia by the higher-ups who wanted to straight up replace him with Kimi Raikkonen. He then jumped before he was pushed and retired before Ferrari could drop him. Allegedly, anyway. His Mercedes return bore no fruit, really, results wise. However, he laid the foundations for the team to succeed after his departure. It might be strange to put a seven time champion this low on the list. However, he could have had three or four more if he acted or drove differently at different points in his career. Fifth on this list is Ayrton Senna. He was brutally fast in one lap pace, but could lack consistency over a season by just being himself. His first year in a championship winning car was in 1988 and the dominant MP44 after spending four seasons getting podium and wins with Tom and Lotus. Winning the title in your first season in the team with Alan Prost as your teammate takes some talent, but his loss in 1989 brings him down a peg. Yes, he was taken out in Suzuka by Prost, but he needed to make up a ridiculous points deficit anyway and win both of the last races in the season, while Prost didn't score. It isn't Senna's fault that he got caught in a crash with back markers and retired in the last race in Adelaide. However, if he'd done better in the rest of the season, he wouldn't have been in that position. His 1990 and 91 titles were both deserved, even if he got retribution at Suzuka in 1990. It's unfortunate he wasn't given another title winning car by McLaren, and if he hadn't have died in Imola, then I think he would have won the 1994 title. If Damon Hill nearly won, then Senna could have won it at a canter. He was a great race winner, but lacked consistency at points in his career, which does bring him down on this list. Everyone beyond this point in the list pretty much won every chance that they had at a title. One of these drivers is Nicky Lauda. He was a perfectionist and wouldn't settle for mediocrity from anyone he worked with. He had a slim chance of a 1974 title and was leading after round 9 of 15, but retired from 5 of the last 6 races which dropped him to 4th. 1975, however, saw him win 5 races on his way to his first title, more than 2 race wins points clear of 2nd placed Emerson Fittipaldi. Then 1976 came, and it is the most interesting and pivotal season in his career, obviously. He was winning it by an absolute mile until his fiery accident at the Nürburgring lost him up to 27 championship points by missing two races and, of course, retiring in that Nürburgring race. Britain James Hunt won two of the three races Lauda didn't score in due to his crash, reducing the gap to two points in the championship. After Nicky's slow return to form, which was understandable considering his whole face had been practically burned off, James Hunt needed to outscore Nicky by four points at the final race in Fuji to take the crown. In sodden, rainy, dangerous conditions, Nicky withdrew from the race after a few laps, not willing to risk his safety a second time that season. 
James Hunt went on to win the title by one point, although I believe that Lauda would have easily cruised to this title if not for the fiery accident. And while Hunt definitely deserved the crown, as he did all he needed to do, I'm not going to hold it against Nicky that he couldn't win it. 1977 was a cakewalk for Lauda, so much that because he was disgruntled with Ferrari and had moved to Brabham for the next season, he sat out the final two races of the season and still won by a margin of practically two race wins. 1978 saw only moderate success as Nicky took two race wins, one driving the infamous fan car at the Swedish Grand Prix in Anderstorp, then he won again at the Italian Grand Prix, the race overshadowed by the death of Ronnie Peterson. 1979 saw Lauda's first winless and podiumless season since 1973, as he only finished two of the 13 races he entered, both in the points however. It was during the Canadian race weekend towards the end of the season where he decided he was going to retire from F1, having become bored of driving around in circles. He directed focus towards his own airline, Lauda Air, but after two seasons out, he was enticed back by McLaren, who wanted a world champion to spearhead their McLaren Project 4 project. He returned in 1982, aged 33, and was back up to the pace soon after, winning the third race of the season in Long Beach. He finished that season fifth in standings, winning also in Brands Hatch. 1983, however, was a disaster as the switch from the now unreliable Ford Cosworth DFVs to tag Porsche engines meant a litany of retirements. 1984, however, was a different story. Although Nicky retired from six of the first nine races, he took three wins and three second places in the last seven races to usurp young upstart Alain Prost. Experience beat youth, and although it might have been lucky that Prost lost points at certain points of the season, such as in Monaco, where there was only half points given, that's racing. Nicky may have only won by half a point, but he won nonetheless. 1985 was another season full of retirements, but Nicky got his final one in Zandvoort before retiring for good, focusing on his airline and other businesses, before becoming an ambassador for Mercedes F1 during the 2010s, where he was a great contributor to their dominance. He died in 2019, but his legacy lives on and will continue well into the future. Alain Prost was a serial championship winner during his time in F1. If they used the modern point system during his career, which rewards consistency now more than during Prost's era, Alan would have been an eight-time world champion. After he turned down an opportunity to race for McLaren at the back end of 1979 due to not feeling ready for F1, his debut season in 1980 saw him perform equal to his experienced race-winning teammate John Watson by scoring just one less point than him. He moved to Renault for 1981, but struggled to mount any serious title challenges for the next couple of seasons, as the yellow teapot was as temperamental as Graham Hill's plane was in fog. When he moved to McLaren in 1984, he was beaten by Nicky Lauda in his first season by just half a point, then he won at a canter the year after. He also won 1986 as the two Williams of Mantle and Piquet were too busy fighting amongst themselves or they were having colossal tyre problems. 1987 was an off year for McLaren, but 1988 saw him get a new teammate in Ayrton Senna as the car catapulted back into contention. Senna beat him in 1988, although Allen had better results overall. Due to drop scores, he lost out. 1989 saw Allen win the title easily with absolutely no points of contention when he was second to Senna the year after as Allen switched over to Ferrari and again there were no problems between the two at all. 1991 saw Ferrari make a shit car and Prost was nowhere, winning no races and only finished fifth in a driver's championship, also sitting out the last two races as Ferrari had sacked him for saying the car handled like a truck when it lost power steering. I mean that's usually how F1 cars work. He was rumoured to join Ligier for 1992, however instead he chose to take a sabbatical before returning in 1993 driving for a dominant Williams team, booting reigning champion Nigel Mansell out of his seat and he promptly won the title in dominant fashion. He then retired from F1, meaning he left F1 with 51 wins and 4 titles. He ruffled lots of feathers but he was a very fast and very clever driver. When people compare him to Senna, I always say, if you want race wins, choose Senna, if you want championships, pick Prost. Jim Clark didn't just win titles, he dominated championships. His first competitive season was 1962. He won three races and got six pole positions, but retired from pole position four times out of nine races. Despite not finishing in the points in more than half of the races that year, he still finished runners-up in the year's standings. After bad luck in 1962, Jim dominated in 1963. Seven poles and seven wins in ten races, in an era where only the best six results counted. Therefore, he took 100% of the available points that year due to those seven wins. If you counted all the points he garnered across the season, he would nearly triple the tally of second place Graham Hill, scoring 73 to the Englishman's 29. 1964 was a down year, as despite leading the championship halfway through the season, he failed to score points in four of the last five races of the season. 
dogged by reliability problems, meaning he only finished third in the driver's standings. 1965, however, saw more dominance like 63, as he won six of the first seven races of the season. The only one he didn't win was Monaco because he was too busy winning the Indy 500 to turn up to that race. Then after those six wins, he failed to score in any of the remaining races in the season, but again, took the maximum points available in the season. That's pure dominance of the highest order, and he is the only person in F1 history to take maximum points in a season, and he's done it twice. After Lotus suffered from reliability and performance issues in 1966 and 67, things were looking up at the start of 1968 as Jim won the opening round in South Africa. However, his premature death in an F2 race in Hockenheim cut short his ambitions of a third title. Jim didn't win the most titles, nor the most races, but he was always limited by his machinery. If he was born in today's era, he would easily be able to take championships as reliability is better today and driver performance is still very important. Unless he drove a Ferrari, that is, because the strategy and the team in itself would just combust around him. Juan Manuel Fangio is basically Jim Clark without the untapped potential. He was undoubtedly the best driver of his era and only lost a 1950 championship due to poor reliability towards the end of the season. In 1951, he beat Alberto Ascari to his first title. However, in 1952 and 53, Ascari's Ferraris were dominant and Ascari and Ferrari won pretty much every race while... Fangio sat out 52 due to breaking his neck before the season started, then ran Maseratis in 1953 before moving to the new Mercedes Works team for 1954. He would comfortably take both the 1954 and 55 titles before Mercedes pulled out of racing following the Le Mans disaster. He had no other option but to join Ferrari in 1956, although he didn't like Enzo Ferrari nor the way the team was run. Nonetheless, he won the title partly due to the magnanimous Peter Collins giving up his chance at a title fight to help Fangio win his fourth. Fangio then won the 1957 title driving for the Maserati before retiring from full-time driving after realising following his stupendous drive at the Nordschleife that he could no longer drive at the speeds he could at the German race. He recovered a minute's time difference in the 10 laps of a dangerous German circuit, beating his own lap record 9 times in the process and beating his pole position time from a year before by 24 seconds over the 9 minute lap. He did a few races in 1958 including the Indy 500 but clearly didn't care as much as he did before. He won five of his six championship potential seasons, and that elusive sixth could have come in 1950 if things went differently with reliability. Nonetheless, he and everyone on this list are or were fantastic drivers who are great in their own right. I hope you agree with my picks, however if you don't, tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. Please keep it respectful, but I know you're all great at that anyway. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you all later. I've been Nedso. Bye!